Hello and welcome to this video and on this video we're going to be looking at 10 moments when mainstream artists went prog or went jazz rock fusion. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at 10 times, you know, this is not a ranking video, it's just 10, because it's a nice round number, you know, 10 times a mainstream artist, this is an artist that most people would know, you know, it's like a, if you went up to the average person in the street and said, you know, this artist, they should know all the artists on here, I hope or would at least know some music by them, 10 times they went prog or fusion, okay? So um, I think I'll kick straight in. Uh, and I some of these really do outline some of the strangest moments in pop history. So um, I think we're gonna enjoy this one, but I'm gonna start off with a really obvious one uh, from the 1980s, and it's when Sting went solo. So this is my first choice, is when Sting went solo in the mid 80s. Sting, of course, originally was a jazz musician. He would played jazz with his group Last Exit. When he formed The Police, he formed um, a band with uh, Andy Summers on guitar, who had already had a career in the world of progressive rock with musicians like Kevin Ayers. And he had a drummer with Stuart Copeland that had already played progressive rock in Curved Air. So although this band, uh, although the police was marketed as a sort of post-punk band, that actually that band was full of prog and jazz fusion virtuosity. And those things are evident in some of the police tracks. In 1985, uh, Sting leaves the police. The police um, call it a day. I think it's actually 1984. The, the police call it a day. And, and he embarks on a solo career. And Sting does something I think that's really, really important and actually changed the music industry. Being a big uh, jazz and jazz fusion fan, he decided to pull musicians into a band, his own solo band, from the world of jazz. So he pulled in from Weather Report, Omar Hakim on drums, from Miles Davis's band, Daryl Jones on bass, um, Branford Marsalis, who's of course the brother of Winter Marsalis, and he brought in Winter Marsalis's pianist, um, oh, <laughs> Kenny Kirkland, right. Uh, it's like I said, I have no notes for these, I just go for it. So yeah, he had Kenny, the late great Kenny Kirkland on piano. Uh, and a couple of um, backing singers, Delek McDonald was one of them, I can't remember the other one. And he made an album called The Dream of the Blue Turtles. Now, I'm sure many of you will be saying, was that album really a fusion album? Did he go fusion? Well, I would not say across the whole album he went fusion, but there's definitely moments which are very interesting for a mainstream, you know, pop, rock album, or whatever you want to call it. Um, when the album came out, I can remember I was a huge jazz fusion fan at the time. And this album came out, and I can remember I was at school, and they brought us into an assembly, and they did the assembly on the First World War. It was like close to Remembrance Sunday. And uh, they decided to play a song by Sting as part of the assembly called Children's Crusade, which starts off, and it's, a, it's an incredible piece of songwriting. You know, Sting's one of the great songwriters, which, you know, compares um, sort of the children that went to, into the First World War, the very young young men that went into the First World War, with the children that went on the Crusades. There was a children's crusade. And it also then brings that up to date and it compares it against, you know, young people who were addicted to drugs, heroin, and it sort of uses the poppy as a sort of combining uh, motif across it. You know, Sting's a heavy songwriter. But in the middle of that, they just took off. And they go off into this sort of weather report, jazz fusion, soprano sax fueled solo, and they just let loose at that moment. It is just pure fusion. I can remember being in my school, being pulled into assembly in utter shock as all the uh, people in my school sat there, you know, pretending to, you know, be sad and quiet about Remembrance Sunday whilst listening to some of the heaviest jazz blasting out of the assembly hall speakers. I can remember it was just so strange that this inner world that I had at home and listened to Weather Report, the Mavish Doctor, had suddenly come flooding into my school and nobody noticed, nobody noticed. Um, after that, um, when they went out on tour, Sting did a documentary where he covered the uh, sort of... Um, making the album and especially the tour of this band called Bring On The Night. 
the whole um, film that was directed by, I think, Michael Apted, who had made um, those great rock and roll movies in the 70s, uh, That'll Be The Day, and uh, Stardust with David Essex, some of the great films on rock, rock sort of music. He was brought in to direct it. So it's a proper film. It wasn't just like a sort of thrown together sort of TV do documentary. And this film has some incredible footage of that band playing jazz fusion. So f for, for a moment, you, what you had was the, one of the biggest pop stars on the planet out touring, releasing mainstream films into the cinema uh, and, you know, basically pushing not jazz fusion, but moments of jazz fusion right into the face of the general public, the unsuspecting general public. And I think this is the theme of this list, you know, is, is you know, every now and then we get all these things that we love of prog and jazz fusion thrust onto normal people, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. And often the case is that they will just take it. Nobody bats an eyelid. Nobody said he's what Sting up to. Now, I think what Sting did was very important because um, up until then, there'd been the world of session musicians. And we know the world of session musicians were full of people who could play jazz and prog and all that sort of stuff. But um, such a big deal was made of the fact that Sting's musicians were jazz musicians. I think from then on, jazz musicians then went, became the go-to musicians um, for high-end session work. So that, that means if you were to look in Madonna's band at that time, you were going to find people that had been pulled in, in some respects from the jazz world. And I think Omar Hakim actually went on to um, uh, play with Madonna. And uh, Darrell Jones, of course, went on to the bass position in the Rolling Stones. Um, alongside Steve Jordan, another one of the great fusion drummers of all time. So I think he set into president of, of sort of mainstream music, the right, the sort of royalty end, pulling from the jazz world for their, you know, session musicians. Anyway, that's my first choice, okay? Um, my second choice is Ariana Grande performing with Thundercat, J.D. Beck and Domi on the track Them Changes. Um, if you go onto YouTube and Google Ariana Grande and Thundercat, J Them Changes, you will find a, a, some footage, a sort of psychedelic backdrop of them playing Thundercat's Them Changes. Now, the difference between this version of Them, them Changes and Thundercat's usual version is that when they get to the solo, they take off. Ariana Grande does not bat an eyelid. Uh, this is quite a recent example uh, of um, cutting edge jazz fusion, butting up straight with pop music. You know, my daughter who's 11 and knows Ariana Grande and doesn't get any of the music I like and she thinks it's absolutely terrible. You know, this untrendy old jazz fusion that I like. And when that happened, I can remember her face was quite perturbed to see Ariana Grande sort of dancing around whilst, you know, Thundercat, J.D. Beck and Domi played some of the heaviest music around. Now, the thing is with Thundercat is he has become a mainstream artist. You know, this guy appeared in um, one of the Star Wars TV series. Which one was it? Um, it was, uh, it could well have been the... Obi-Wan Kenobi one I think is that the one he's on well you'll tell me but anyway he's mainstream enough to appear in a Disney you know Star Wars TV series uh, and uh, the reason for this is because he was one of the musicians that was pulled into Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly uh, and I nearly put that in the second position I believe that Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly is not only an out and out jazz fusion album and it is i mean there's one moment when he's rapping and the music sounds like 60s coltrane it is pure modal jazz um with some of the most heaviest you know burning playing he's got robert glasper on there he's got um the thundercats on there there's a whole host of modern jazz fusion musicians um and kendrick lamar knowingly went to those guys to get that sound. He wanted to experiment and he went and found jazz musicians to experiment. And of course, hip hop has always done this. There is no hip hop without jazz. You know, uh, the great hip hop producers were the producers that knew how to take the innovations of jazz fusion and turn them around and weave them into that sort of, you know, jazz beat poetry that uh, groups like The Last Poets had um, innovated. And then obviously people like Gil Scott Heron 
and then African Bam Barter and Sugar Hill Gang and Grandma's Flash, all that history all the way through. Jazz was in right from the very beginning. He knows where the source is, but what's really interesting about uh, To Pimp a Butterfly, it's an out and out prog album. You know, it's, it's conceptual, it's vast, it's got tempo changes, weird time signatures, it uses technology in a really interesting way, and it's knitted together with an overriding conceptual theme that runs through it. It's a prog album. Is it like a progressive rock album like Genesis? You know, is it like Supper's Ready? Well, it, its lineage is, is from mass. Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, are the prog fans going to sit and listen to it the same way that they would listen to Carnival 9? No, of course they wouldn't. But it is a progressive rock album. Um, but I'm not going to put that on my list at number two. I've sort of thrown them in. I've put two in together there for you, so go and check that out. But if, yeah, if you want to see Ariana, Ariana Grande bopping away and singing backing vocals with Thundercat on some of the heaviest jazz fusion exploratory soling you're ever going to see, go and have a look now. I might put the link in the thing below. I think I might do that. Yes, so what have we got number three? Okay, right, so number three, I have Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Right now, I, I, uh, when I did my 10 greatest prog tracks of all time, I put Bohemian Rhapsody in. And a lot of people came storming in saying, Queen aren't prog, right? Well, if Queen aren't prog, then Genesis isn't prog. And Pink Floyd isn't prog, right? Genesis have been around now for 50 years. Right, the first 10 years of, no, not in the first 10 years, the first eight years they made prog. The rest of the time they made pop music. They made another type of music altogether. Um, but Genesis is still a prog band because they made prog, right? Now, Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody is not the only example of Queen making prog. Are all their songs prog, right? Is another one Bites the Dust prog? No, that's like a disco tune. No, it's not, <laughs> right? Now, um, you anal retentive gatekeeping prong nerds that like to have everything in the box and all nice and neat, right? And they might not be able to take this, but Queen not only venture into prog, right? But when they venture into prog, they make highly successful um, culture changing prog, right? Bohemian Rhapsody is about as prog as it gets, right? It's about as prog as it gets. Now, one of the things that Queen have got, which I think sets them apart from so many other bands, is they're able to write not just a very catchy hook, but they're able to write the sort of catchy hook that you can sing down the pub, right? This is what differentiates them from Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, right? We all love smoke on the water, right? But no one's gonna sing, you know, with a drink, you know, um, um, smoke on the water fire in the sky, you know, and I was gonna sit there doing that. But if everyone's having a nice time, they could easily sing, we are the champions, right? Um, I once did a gig with a covers band and um, halfway, it was, a, it was a wedding, so it was pretty important, right? Very important day for people who are getting married. And um, at one point, the power went and we were plunged into pitch blackness, right? It was like out in a, sort of tent thing that was outside and you know, the power is gone, it's pitch black, there's 200 people, we're in the middle of the gig, we didn't know what to do, we got no PA, the only thing that will make a sound in that room is me on my acoustic drums and the audience. And I went into boom, boom, blap, boom, boom, blap, boom, boom, blap. And then our singer shouted out to them, we will, we will rock you. And they all kept, kept and we were able to keep the gig going by the drums and the audience singing Queen songs, right? Now, this is an attribute, okay, that Yes and Genesis and ELP, they don't have that attribute, right? But does this mean that Bohemian Rhapsody is not a prog song? Well, I tell you something, because they have that ability of hitting you in the face with sing-along parts, Right, we forget that Bohemian Rhapsody does that over and over again within about six or seven minutes. But what they condense into that is the same amount of composition material that Yes do on Close to the Edge, right? And they do it better. Sorry, they do it better. 
Okay, so many prog bands clunk their way compositionally. You know, they basically got one song and then they've got another song and they clunk their way from one place to the next. It's actually quite rare where you get a progressive rock band that are able to compose with themes and repetition and with things logically moving from one place to another um, in the way that a classical composer like Beethoven, you know, or Tchaikovsky can, right? That's really difficult to do. Queen, do it on Bohemian Rhapsody. It gives you everything, right? Absolutely everything. Virtuosity, complexity, the great majestic bit, the little bit that opens up, the guitar solos. It gives you everything. And it's so well composed that you do not notice it. It's so well composed that people will sit down the pub singing it. Right, this is an absolutely great achievement. If I carry on talking like this, I will start to think that Bohemian Rhapsody is actually the greatest progressive rock track ever made. And I don't want to end up there because of course it's awakened by yes. All right, so Bohemian Rhapsody is out and out prog. If you think it's not, put your argument in the comments. Come on, let's have a go. Put your argument in the comments and tell me why Bohemian Rhapsody isn't prog. Now, does that mean Queen are prog or not? Well, no band is prog or not prog. They are only prog when they're doing prog. And when they're doing Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen are prog. Right, have you got it? Queen are prog. So I wanted to say that, so that's why I put them at number three. You know, when people say these silly things on my channel, I wish I was one of those more, you know, temperate YouTubers that could just brush it aside and go, oh, well, yeah, they're entitled to their opinion. I'm not like that, I'm afraid. I like to have the discussion. And all you people who disagree, I love you ever so much because this is the fun. It's all fun. You know, we're not arguing about anything that really matters, are we? In the end, this is the place where we can have fun expressing our ideas. And nobody's ever right and nobody's ever wrong, except I am always a bit more right than the other person. So what have we got at number four? We have perhaps the greatest sidelong prog epic of the 1980s. This could well be the greatest prog epic of the last 40 years. And it's by one of the most mainstream artists. You know, this, this person's had so many hit records and they've just had a worldwide hit record just a few months ago this summer when their song off the same album, Running Up That Hill, was featured on that TV show that all the kids like, Stranger Things. Is it Stranger Things? I've forgotten about it now. We will forget about that TV series. In five years' time, we will all be trying to remember the name of that TV series. Sorry, because that's how culture works. But we won't forget Kate Bush, will we? And on um, The Hounds of Love, side two has a whole epic side-long prog monstrosity, right? And I really believe that this track is one of the greatest progressive rock tracks ever made. And it's called The Ninth Wave. Now I'm sure that many progressive rock fans will be running to their little comments now to say The Ninth Wave is not prog, it's art rock. Okay, now the reason they're going to say that is because um, some of the more classical formal structural things that we associate with perhaps yes, Genesis at some points and ELP are not apparent on that track. Okay, um, it's it's it is exactly what I said. You know that uh, um, some composers do. It's it's a sequence that moves. But the thing is, Kate Bush's strength has always been the ideas. It's always been the conceptual continuity within which she pulls these things together. But the reason why I would argue it's prog is that if this was a mainstream artist basically creating a suite, I, I would still be arguing that this is still a very interesting moment for a mainstream artist. But in actual fact, the ninth wave contains so much experimentation, it, it contains virtuosity. There's one point, uh, Wake in the Witch, which is so strange. It's so strange that we would get that from a mainstream artist on a mainstream album, like one of the biggest selling albums of all time, really, in terms of UK artists. Very strange. And at another moment, it goes into sort of a Celtic Irish folk um, passage, which is so virtuoso with such incredible odd times in it. Kate Bush is able to do all the things that you would expect from a progressive rock band, but present it in a way where you don't feel it's progressive rock. She does it all right um 
The other thing that makes this album so important is the use of the Fairlight synthesizer. It's, it's the beginning of the sampler as a compositional tool. Peter Gabriel had really um, pioneered this in the early 80s and um, Kate Bush had learned from him. And by the time she gets to um, Hounds of Love, that technology has really been wound in. And this is why I argue that this is the most important prog epic of the 80s. The 70s progressive rock bands did not have that sampling capability. And progressive rock is always part of it for me. One of the part, part of one of the definitions for progressive rock is the use of uh, contemporary technology, okay, to, um, to advance the music form. This is why when the whole dance music thing happened in the late 80s, early 90s, which was so based upon technology, it harkened back to so much progressive rock with bands like The Orb and System 7. And Kate Bush is part of that lineage for me. And I think that's why the sound is so different, right? Um, so we don't hear string quartets, we don't hear orchestral, but it feels like we do because of the use of the sampler. And I think this is one of the progressive aspects, right? Uh, the fact is, here we have one of the biggest album selling albums of the 1980s. It's again come back and, you know, gone back it's straight into mainstream culture. And on side two is one side long epic called The Ninth Wave, which is about as musically experimental as it gets. And I find that very exciting. Um, on the radio this morning, there was a report that people are listening to more and more music. Right. So as much as people will say the music industry is dying and in certain aspects it is, it is without a doubt dying, but people are listening to more music and that was put down to people, especially young people, listening to more older music. Now this is something that, um, you know, streaming does, is that uh, the whole music world, world is out there, the whole music history is out there now. And you can listen to whatever you want. You know, in my time, the stuff that was played on the radio was just stuff that was coming out at that time. Oh, hang on, my dog's just coming here. Sorry about this. All right, it's, it's, it's all right, he's gone, he's gone. So yeah, so um, my dog every now and then pushes his way in. He has to try and come in, you see, and uh, I'd left my door open. You don't hear this, but every now and then there'll be a scratching at the door and it's my dog trying to get in. You know, he hasn't got much to say about progressive rock, but you know, he wants to say it. Anyway, let's get back on track. I'm totally lost my thread now. Kate Bush, um, this, I remember where we're at now. Yeah, so this um, ability for people to go and listen to whatever they want, rather than the old way that you only had new songs coming out and then new albums coming out, and that's what the radio is playing. And if you want to listen to something old, you would have to go research it and find the album. A lot of the time, a lot of the fusion and prog that I was into in the 80s, you couldn't get the albums, they were deleted. Um, this, this was the big search that I, I went on throughout my teens, you know, was trying to find these albums. And this opens everything up and I think it's very, you know, um, it, 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 it's assuring that young people are actually going back and finding the worth of this music, you know. Whereas a lot of contemporary music, that is being produced by companies. I think out in this sort of um, unsigned world of Bandcamp, there's some incredibly experimental music going on at the moment. Um, but the mainstream's putting out, you know, very shallow music on the whole. Uh, the uh, use of computers has now, I think, blanded out a lot of the, the uh, sort of emotional aspects of music making. And so young people are able to go back and discover an album like Hounds of Love and discover, you know, a track which you can enter into a whole world. Um, I, I, um, I've talked about the Ninth Wave on another video um, and um, I really needed to get my head around that track and I had to listen to it three times to really understand what was going on. I think that's hopeful, don't you? I, that people are still doing that. And that's why these rare moments when the mainstream opens it up to these experimental jazz fusion and progressive rock and also electronica and all these sorts of when that it ends into the mainstream it's very very interesting um kate bush is also here at on number four in my list for her on the never forever album her foray into jazz fusion there's a track on there called egypt 
which is without doubt channeling the Mavish Nuxtra and has even a jazz fusion style Moog solo in an odd time signature in the middle of it. So jazz fusion fans, if you feel a little bit less that, you know, left out by a Kate and you want to hear Kate go jazz fusion, go and check out Egypt off the album Never Forever, which I think came out in 1980. Right, so what have we got at number five? Oh, this is one of the great albums. This is the, one of the reasons why I'm here is because of this album. Right, and we're talking about one of the richest musicians on the planet. You know, I, I once looked into the, who the richest musicians on the planet were, and this guy is a billionaire. He's that big, he's a billionaire. And this person who has made billions out of music, that has written so many songs that everybody knows, is of course Andrew Lloyd Webber. Right, so Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, the guy that did all those horrible musicals. Right, Cats and Starlight Express or whatever he did. You know, all that stuff, right? Um, in 1978, after losing a bet to his brother, Julian Lloyd Weller, who was an orchestral cellist, he lost a bet which meant, and I don't know what the bet was, but the payoff of the bet is he had to write a piece for his brother. And so what he decided to do was take uh, Paganini's Caprice in A minor number 24 which has a series of variations and create a number of variations which pulled from contemporary progressive rock and jazz fusion and he made an album called Variations. Um, the opening variation which I think is called Theme Paganini Caprice A minor number 24 that one then got picked up as the theme for the South Bank Show. And the South Bank Show was an arts program that ran in the UK for a number of years. And it was very valuable. They did an incredible documentary on John McLaughlin's Shakti in the late 70s. And in the early 80s, they did a, a documentary on um, Weather Report, which I can remember seeing the Weather Report one. Uh, this was a very momentous moment. And the theme to that was off this album. In 1978, when this album came out, everyone went to bought, bought it. Every parent of all my mates at school, if you went round to their house, they would have a copy of Variations in the house, sat next to War of the Worlds. Everyone had a, had a War of the Worlds as well. Andrew Lloyd, Vari Andrew Lloyd Webber's Variations, right, is basically, the band on that is Coliseum 2. And Coliseum 2 was John Heisman's jazz fusion band with progressive rock overtones that, that emerged in the mid-70s. Now, John Heisman is one of the, the Britain's great drummers and absolutely virtuoso. He, in, he emerged in the 1960s as a drummer, a technical drummer. He's way past the John Bonhams and Ian Paces and, and all those classic rock drums, as incredible as they are, they did not have the technical virtuosity of, of John Heisman. Um, John Heisman sort of came up through the sort of um, rhythm and blues bands of the late sixties and eventually in 68, he firmed, formed a band called Coliseum. This often gets labeled as being one of the early progressive rock bands. But of course, this is where at that time, Progressive rock could mean jazz fusion or progressive rock. Coliseum is actually um, a highly original, innovative, groundbreaking jazz rock band, right? Um, he then formed a band called Tempest, which is a, did some incredible fusion in the early 70s, uh, um, featured a very young Alan Holdsworth, and then he reforms Coliseum 2. And the difference between Tempest and Coliseum 2 is Coliseum 2 is heavier. Right, it's more guitar orientated. It's it's a little bit more a bit a little bit like a British Aldemiola. You know, that's that's how to describe Coliseum too. They did three albums which are in, which are fusion classics. They, they get mentioned all the time and I, I have talked about them on the channel and I'm talking about them again. And Electric Savage, War Dance and Strange, New Flesh, those three albums are three of the great fusion albums of the 70s and definitely three of the great British fusion albums of the 70s. But we have to count in that as well. Variations, because they're all over it. The band that um, John Heisman had, the version of Coliseum on this, is uh, Gary Moore on Gibson Les Paul and Fender Strat. We've got Rod Argent from Argent on um, Grand Piano Synthesizers Mini Moog. Don Airy, who later went on to a sort of Classic rock success with the um, Rainbow, and uh, I think he doesn't he play keyboards with Deep Purple now. 
Um, he was also on Grand Piano Synthesizers, Arp Odyssey, Mini Moog, Selena String Ensemble, Fender has electric piano. We've got Barbara Thompson, who is who was um, John Heisman's wife. Um, they they both sadly died recently. Um, John Heisman a few years ago, and Barbara Thompson relatively recently. And they they sort of went out in a whimper. But these musicians were so important to British jazz fusion, and I have to shout out for Barbara Thompson's paraphernalia as well, um, which was one of the great British jazz fusion bands. Um, we had John Moll on, um, I think he's on fretless bass on this, on the on a lot, on the whole. John Moll on the whole is on fretless bass, but it says he's also playing Defender Precision. And of course, John, John Heisman on drums. Um, they're joined by a few extra musicians. We've got um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, who's actually coming in and playing synthesizer on this. We've got Bill Lesage on a vibraphone. Um, Herbie Flowers, the great Herbie Flowers, who's responsible for that iconic bass line on Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side on bass. And Phil Collins on drums. He got on everything. This is 1978 in the UK. He's on virtually everything. He crops up from anything from Brian Eno to Adam and the Ants. You know, he's, he's, ev he's everywhere at this point. And we have um, Julian Lloyd Webber on cello, who, who is the, the central artist of this album, alongside the London Philharmonic Orchestra. This is out and out prog. It's out and out jazz fusion. Gary Moore throws some incredible, incredibly virtuoso speed jazz fusion metal guitar solos on here. It was a huge influence on me. You know, it was um, one of the first times I heard jazz fusion and prog was this, was this album. And it was in everybody's home. And if you go around and search people of a certain age record collection, it will be in there. And if you do see this on vinyl, you know, uh, cropping up in your second hand record, um, or you're not in your second hand record, but just your sort of um, charity shop somewhere, buy it, but you won't. I've noticed it's disappeared because it's a collector's item. Everyone knows this is an incredible album. Right, so yeah, so that's what I've got at number, um, was it number five, was Andrew Lloyd Webber's Variation from 1970. What an incredible album. This next one, we might not describe this as an incredible album, but I, I want to talk about it a little bit. And it is Music from the Elder by Kiss, all right? Uh, so um, this came out in 1981, all right? Uh, now, I'm no expert on Kiss. I think this is the first time... I've ever mentioned Kiss on this channel. I'm not a Kiss fan. I'm a big rock fan. I'm a big metal fan. I, I love all those American rock bands. I never liked Kiss. I've seen Kiss twice live. I saw them in 88 at the Monsters of Rock Festival, um, which I will be talking about on another video. So we will talk about that then. And I saw them when they redid the Alive tour, which I think was probably in the, the 90s or the 2000s. Um, the stage show was incredible on that, but I can remember being bored out of my mind, right? Kiss to me, a sort of, it's all about the makeup. <laughs> it's all about the image. That's what's great about them. When I was a kid, I had a Kiss poster on my wall. I thought they looked amazing, right? The music, you know, I never really got it um, at all. Didn't like it. They sort of come out with sort of a hard rock thing, you know, um, and then they go almost disco, don't they? And I think as they entered the 80s, they'd been so iconic and so huge during the 70s, they didn't know quite what to do. And even though music from the elder seems like the most ridiculous choice to make, when you actually step back, maybe at the time it wasn't. So what is music of the elder? Well, Music of the Elder is an album, it's like, um, I would say it's prog, right? <laughs> um, it's, it tell, it, <laughs> I can't even, it's just, I can't even believe it exists. I, I, I got into music in 1980, I was into rock music, I'd listened to Kiss, I didn't like them. But in 1981 when this album came out, there was a big hoo-ha about it, you know, and I remember looking at it and thinking, what the hell's going on here? Um, Kiss wanted to make a film. They wanted to make a film with a story and they thought that this was going to be a blockbuster film and they wanted to create music that went along with that film. Right, so what they created is an album called Music from the Elder. The Elder would have been the film. That It features an orchestra. It features a storyline that runs through. Um, it's not sort of hard rock at all. It's actually much softer and actually quite poppy tunes but are, that are pulled together 
you know, by this sort of orchestral thread and this narration. Um, I think they were looking around to find a way that their theatrical sort of empire could expand, okay? Um, David Lee Roth did exactly the same thing when he left Van Halen. You know, the, the whole David Lee Roth band started off, the Vibe band started off with David Lee Roth exploring the idea of moving into film. This, this seems a logical thing to do. If you think that they were trying to create an album which would be the soundtrack to a film, this makes a lot more sense. Um, their producer, Bob Ezrin, that had produced all the classic albums like, you know, Destroy and all that, he'd gone off and made The Wall. Now, The Wall is precisely that. The, you know, The Wall is this huge double album soundtrack to this story, which does eventually become an actual film by Alan Parker. Um, and this has been the biggest album in history. So it's logical that Kiss would look at The Wall would look at their producer who produced the wall, at least co-produced the wall, and would think, we should have a go at this, and we could, that's a way we can soften our sound and make our sound more poppy. So there's a logic behind them doing this. Of course, when it came out, I think, without the accompanying film, because that fell through, and the fact as well that the record company panicked and took the storyline and took the songs and rejigged them into an order so no one else would help know what the hell was going on, um, by the time this actually was released, they knew it was a failure. They didn't tour it, they didn't push it. Who knows what would happen if they did push it. But yes, yeah, so what we have here is a complete anomaly in Kiss's catalogue. Um, more recently, this has been reappraised, and I start, I'm starting to think that they, you know, they, they, they are uh, starting to see the sort of interest in this sort of proggy approach to this album that the, the critics are starting to see the worth of this, you know. Um, I've listened to it, and for me, not being a Kiss fan, I like it as much as all their other stuff. I think I like it a little bit more. Um, after that, they then changed their approach, and I think, did they not make, you know, I'm no Kiss expert, and I'm not going to pretend I am, but I think they made an album called Creatures in the Night. Is that true? And it in that did that co uh, contain their hits, hit, hit record, I Love It Loud? I absolutely love I Love It Loud. That is just a piece of brilliance. I don't know what it, why I like that. The drum sounds incredible. You know, the, the riffs are so heavy. I think Gene Simmons is singing, and I like, I like Kiss better when Gene sings than when Paul Stanley. When Paul Stanley, it all becomes a little bit, you know, sort of, you know, camp showy rock music it's it's that end of rock music i don't really like you know um and, and of course then they brought their took their makeup on and joined the ranks of poison and all those 80s hair metal bands which of course they pioneered anyway that's what i've got a number six is kiss right and the music from the elder from 1981. at number seven i have got contusion off the album Songs in the Key of Life by Stevie Wonder. I, right, now Stevie Wonder, one of the most important and biggest, you know, pop acts in history. Uh, revered by absolutely everybody, anyone who doesn't rate Stevie Wonder as an absolute fool. You know, he, he not only had huge chart success, hit records, but he's also loved by musicians around the whole world. I believe that um, the classic run of albums in the 70s by Stevie Wonder, that all those albums are fusion albums, but they're fusion albums with vocals. It's as simple as that. And that Stevie Wonder is a fusion musician uh, with that amount of chops, but he's also an incredible songwriter. And, you know, he was able to take the jazz fusion sound and make it commercial. Um, that run of classic albums in the 70s, he's at his artistic peak and commercial peak when he makes songs in the key of life and in the middle of that is an instrumental trap called contusion which is out and out jazz fusion now if we get into the history behind stevie wonder right um it's far more interesting than you think there's a thing about stevie wonder that never gets discussed stevie wonder's a child prodigy and he's discovered by Barry Gordy and Motown. And he makes his first album in 1962. This album is an instrumental album. And the selling point of that album, and it wasn't a success, but they sold it on the idea that this little kid could play everything. So he's playing all the instruments on that album, uh, but he's not singing, all right? 
Then they think, well, how are we going to market this guy? You know, he's blind. He's a virtuoso musician. Maybe we'll market him like, um, uh, like um, Ray Charles. And uh, the second album he makes is the music of Ray Charles. Okay, I think he sings on that album. But the idea that Stevie Wonder is even going to sing is not in Motown's mind. That's like, you know, do we get him to sing or do, or is it the thing that he's a multi-instrumentalist? Um, at one point in the, in the 60s, he makes another instrumental album, which is his name backwards, which I won't try and pronounce, Evie, it's one or something like that. But that there's a, there's a, there's instrumental albums, but all the way through this, what is interesting is he is not writing songs, okay? Towards the end of the 60s, early 70s, he's had hits like My Sherry and More, where he's, he's been allowed to co-write by then, but it's not obvious that he's going to even write his own songs, okay? Um, there is a show, I, I think in 70 he makes an album with his, his, his then wife, Cyrita, where he starts writing songs. But the truth is, and this is what's really bizarre about Steve, what, Stevie Wonder, he makes 13 albums before he does Music of the Mind, uh, which is in 1972. I'm just to, yeah, Music of My Mind, 1972. And Music of My Mind is like Stevie Wonder's first album, really. Up until then, he's been doing something else. He's had some records of things like Uptight and My Sherry and more, but it's not the Stevie Wonder we know. What's prompted this is Marvin Gaye with what's going on. Right, and Marvin Gaye changes, not the music industry, everyone says he changed it. There was loads of, oh, there's, there's always been black soul acts, you know, being political, right? You know, I mean, James Brown was doing it before this. This is not a thing. Um, it's Motown. It's the fact that Motown was about to change from out and out pop music to something heavier. And I think at that point, you know, Stevie Wonder is then given full creative control and he makes a run of albums. Music of the Mind, Inner Visions, uh, that first finale one, um, Songs in the Key of Life. And then after Songs in the Key of Life, he, he does The Secret Life of Plants, which is one of the most esoteric, it's, it, it's like his Tales from Topographic Oceans. And it's is equally bizarre, but what we have with Songs in the Key of Life is, oh, Talking Book, that was the other one. That's what put me off there. That, that run of albums are brilliant. Some of the greatest albums ever made their fusion albums. And here we have Contusion, an out and out fusion track by the great Stevie Wonder. I've got that at number seven on my list. And number eight, I have Curtain Call from 1980 by The Damned, right? It is a nonsense that um, punk is like the antithesis of prog. It is a nonsense that punk came along and did away with prog, did away with his overblownness, right? And replaced it with something else. You know, that music had sort of gone bad. It had gone, it become like overblown and pretentious. And then punk comes along with his new attitude and puts them all in their place, you know? And this is why we have to fight on this channel. We have to fight to say Genesis, yes, Pink Floyd, Gentle Giant, and also the Mavish Doctor, Return to Ever Weather Report, that this is some of the greatest music ever made, and that we should be championing and mentioning it in the same breath as the Beatles, and the Sex Pistols, and Joy Division, and the Stooges, and all the other stuff that, um, you know, Lou Reed, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and all the band, and all the stuff that the critics love to put up there, and I'm not knocking that stuff, but our music should be there as well. It's just as great, and everybody in the know knows that this is the case, right? And those punk bands that came out, right, had prog in their DNA. I, my argument is, yeah, prog had got overblown. Without a doubt, it had been stretched too much, and it needed to condense back in. But punk is actually the net result of prog. It's not the antithesis at all. Um, the musicians who came through those punk bands, right, had grown up listening to prog. We've said this elsewhere, you know, of course, you know, John Lydon being a big fan of Van de Graaff's Generator and taking that vocal sound, that sound from a Peter Hamill, um, 
you know, the Stranglers with their odd time signature, you know, weird progressive rock songs. All the prog is in there. The Clash moving from a sort of out and out, you know, three chord track to, you know, a really quite conceptual, you know, uh, bigger structured band. You know, not a prog band, but the, that tendency there. And the, the other thing that annoys me is is not being able to see the virtuosity that these pop prog bands had you know not necessarily the same virtuosity as a gentle giant but you know with a drummer like top ahead he was a great absolutely great drummer and the damned right the damned with that sort of gothic you know throwback showiness there's there's something progressive in the damned right from the beginning but in 1980, they make an album called The Black Album. Yes, they were the first to do that as well. And on there is a sidelong track called Curtain Call. And this is a prog epic. And it's so wide in its scope. This isn't just three chords being bashed for 25 minutes. This has got electronic experimentation. It's got that sort of orchestral, you know, symphonic rock thing that you would associate with, yes, and, and it's majestic and grand. Curtain Call is an incredible moment as the damned expand their palette out in 1980. And the thing is, what they're doing is the reason why they're going proggy is because they are they're pursuing a territory which is going to become goth. I'm not saying the only, only band that did it because, of course, The Cure are doing this as well. Joy Division are there. But the damned, really, that sort of, sort of outrageously camp part of goth, goth you know in 980 they are deep within it i've got a quote here from captain sensible he, he said it is goth he's talking about this track and this album we didn't set out to do that but that is just the way it is he i think david van in leasing it he did have a hearse he was a grave digger right so it's they're pursuing that vibe, that vibe that we have having Black Sabbath, that vibe that we have in Screaming Jay Hawkins, that vibe that we have in Van de Graaff Generator that's in 21st Century Schizoid Man. That feeling is something that runs through progressive rock, runs through punk into goth, you know, towards bands like, you know, The Cure, but also bands like The Swans, Cabaret Voltaire, Bauhaus. All these bands are dripping with prog. They're dripping with prog. You just have to understand you have to be able to look at the DNA. You have to understand what prog did, right? Prog didn't just make complex music that goes on for 20 minutes. That's not what prog is, okay? You know, Coltrane made tracks that are 20 minutes long that are incredibly complex, but it's not prog. Prog did a whole bunch of things. And these things, these con these conceptual ideas, the sort of English aesthetic, the, the sort of um, allusions to sort of romantic poetry, to... Um, sort of filmic elements all these things the 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 not singing songs about you know love and driving around in cars you know the the themes that prog prog bands pioneered singing about to all the 21st century schizoid man you know and um winston church or plastic bag what a drag all that all that thing is in punk because these musicians came out of prog okay and i think the best example and i haven't given this you know, over on this channel before, I've given loads of other examples where I see this, but Curtain Call by The Damned is the example. And if you're a prog fan, go and listen to it now, right? Don't expect Close to the Edge, but this is a prog epic, without a doubt, okay? Um, the album was reissued at some point, and they took that track off, but I think it's now back on the album, and so it should be. And we should champion this, right? So, um, I now am at number nine all right and at number nine i have got the 23 minute epic play by dave grohl um and uh, this came out in 2018 dave grohl has been such a champion recently of great music you know he he i think has really helped to keep you know played music alive that the performance uh, of uh, the 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 power of rock music now what do we have with this tr track play well what we have and he made it as a film you can go and watch it you know there's a little half an hour film you know we, where he performs this it, what he created was a 23 minute prog epic and this is out and out prog um 
where he's playing all the instruments and you see him so he walks into the room you see him walk into the room sort of five times and one of the one of the Dave Grohls sits behind the drum kit the other one sits behind the bass one sits behind the keyboard one sits behind the guitar and then playing all the instruments himself he sits down and plays this prog rock epic which is is really influenced by Rush it's the 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 uh, the music is is complex and it's in a sweet form and it's well composed it's full on prog but it's all very power chordy and riff based it's all the sort of language of rock it's what rush did so well especially in the early days um and this is this is um i think an example of textbook mainstream artists going down the prog route um there's a video on my channel where i talked about the taylor hawkins uh, tribute concert and I talked about the guys getting up and bringing Rush out. I, I, I really believe that there is a dichotomy that exists in our culture. And I think this is one of the big themes of my channel. Um, all us musicians know, all us musicians know who the influences are. All of, it, all of us musicians know how important, you know, Peter Gable's Genesis was. All, you know, the the... the so many pop musicians in the 80s that were writing hit records had grown up listening to those Peter Gable Genesis albums. Um, all of us know that the Mavish Nocturne is the greatest band of all time. Um, this is the esoteric heart of 20th century and 21st century popular music, and it's still there. You know, musicians know that, but the mainstream don't. And the reason why is because this music has been kept from them. Right, I think the industry, really deep down, they play a game where they try and make out it's to label it pretentious and all that. But I think it pulls away from their power. And I think um, the control that the powers that be have is undermined by true musical genius and it has to be kept in its place. They always want a puppet and they want something that they have ownership of I think that's what it is so um, I've come to my last choice um, uh, and uh, as I made my list I uh, only put nine down I forgot to put the tenth down uh, but I did have a tenth one in so I don't have to rack my brain too much um, the reason why I pulled it off and I forgot to replace it but I will add them now um, is uh, a track by Gino Benelli the War Suite, which is almost a sidelong, and if it's off the Gist of Gemini album. Um, Gino Benelli is, an, you know, occupies a strange place in music. I was going to put it on this list, but I spoke about it on my prog epics that have, don't get um, recognised. There's a video, I can't remember what it's called, I'll put the link for all this down below. And I talk about it at length there, but that is my number 10. So I've come to the end of this video where I've looked at 10 moments when um, mainstream artists went prog or fusion. And I've tried to make it in a, you know, interesting in a way we've been able to explore a lot of areas that we don't normally get to on the channel. So if you've enjoyed this, and you want to um, see more of what I do, please subscribe and like this video. Um, press the notification bell and it will tell you when I'm doing another one. And if you want to support me, I have a Patreon and that, the link's down there and you can support me in that. Um, thanks for listening and I will see you on the next video. Bye.